Perfect. Okay, well, let me start my timer here. So, again, yes, I'm Dr. Schinkeldecker, and uh, I, too, am coming from Germany, as you can tell by my jacket here, uh, which is a Bavarian jacket. In Munich, during Oktoberfest, this would be paired with a fetching later Hosen, but those are both expensive and not stylish outside of the confines of Bavaria, so I will not be wearing the later Hosen. In fact, I didn't get those. They're, they're expensive. Uh, oh, about $2,000 for a good pair. Anyway, I'm not here to talk about later Hosen. I'm here to talk about the molecular universe. The molecular universe. Uh, so, I'm not also going to talk about Venus, although if you've heard the latest Venus announcement, this is quite close to what I'm doing, and in fact was done by some colleagues of mine, including someone who uh, has the same PhD advisor as me. So I can tell you about it, and it's related to what I'm doing, but I will not, Venus will not crop up in this particular presentation. So. Ah, yes, okay, great. So what do I mean when I say the molecular universe? Well, here is, well, this isn't the universe, this is the Milky Way. Uh, all right, so this is what it would look like if you were to take a nice long exposure picture of it. All right. Uh, but I'm not interested so much in the visible universe, I'm interested in the hidden molecular universe. So what does that look like? Well, to a radio astronomer, uh, it looks a little bit like this. All right. So this is the molecular universe. This is tracing here a different part of the, in this case, the galaxy. Here where you see the red, the, the warmer colors, those are corresponding to denser regions of molecular gas and dust. So every time you see the warmer colors here, this is what we're seeing in, with radio astronomy. And so this is what I mean by the, the hidden, the molecular universe. And uh, radio astronomers are looking at this. There's also a black hole right around there that we can see with radio astronomy. But I'm also not going to tell you about that. I should stop telling you about things I'm not going to tell you about. Uh, instead, I'm going to tell you about molecular clouds. Molecular clouds. So, so here's what I mean. So here's the Horsehead Nebula, named for obvious reasons here. Uh, this is the Orion Molecular Cloud Complex here. And these are Thackeray's globules. This is an example of what's called a Bach globule here. These are all molecular clouds here of different types. And when we look at these clouds, we want to know what they're like. We want to know, for instance, uh, the temperature. Well, let, well, let's just say we want to even know how far the molecular gas extends. For that, we look at carbon monoxide, something which there's probably a detector for in this room. Uh, Atomic, uh, molecular hydrogen is the most abundant molecule in the universe, but the second most abundant is carbon monoxide, CO. And so typically, if we want to look at how far a molecular cloud extends, we use radio telescopes and we look at CO. If we want to know the temperature of this region, we'll look at ammonia. This is a molecule that you probably have a bottle of at home for cleaning. Uh, so we look at ammonia, that can tell us the temperature. If we want to know the density, so how, how dense uh, are these clouds, we can look at a molecule called C2, there's two carbon atoms. Uh, for instance, if we want to know how many cosmic rays there are, we can look at a molecule which Dr. Saylor is also interested in, H3+, uh, as well as uh, this molecule, HCO, as well as uh, it's uh, an isomer of a DCO, the D stands for deuterium. Finally, if we want to know the history of one of these, we can also look at molecules. If we want to know if there's been a shock wave that's gone through here hundreds of thousands of years ago, we can't see it, of course, and we can't turn back the clock to, to rewind what we see, but we can look for things like silicon monoxide, which is something in sand. And if we see that floating around in here, we know that there's been a shock wave because you can think of interstellar dust grains that I'll tell you about later as like sand grains and the shock waves shatter the, set, the interstellar dust and release this silicon monoxide, which otherwise would not be floating around just by itself. So we can look at the molecules and it tells us what they're like today, or at least when we see them, and what they were like in the past. And this is the only way we can really know this, is by looking at molecules. All right, 
Another reason why we're interested in these molecular clouds is that these are the regions which go on to form stars and planets. And of course, again, Venus, et cetera, we're, we're very interested in planets. Uh, astronomers are also very interested in stars, probably no surprise there. A lot of astronomy deals with stars as they are now, how they form, all of these questions, how they're going to die. Uh, and so what we're interested in uh, are these regions, these clouds like this, like this box globule here, which then go on to collapse and form uh, star and planet forming regions. So what we're interested in is what's going into forming these things. So you can think of the, this cloud here, this earlier stage, uh, uh, you can think of it like uh, ingredients going into making stars and planets. All right, you can think of this, this is the protoplanetary disk, but you know, maybe think of it like a pizza, okay? So we want to know if, the, if the, the developing solar system is like a pizza, we want to know everything that's going into making that pizza. We want to know exactly all of the ingredients, how much of it there are, so then we can say, okay, you know, what's the pizza going to be like, or to, to go back from this analogy, what, what are the planets going to be like? Are they going to be like Earth? Are they going to be like Jupiter? Uh, what are they going to be made of? What are their atmospheres going to be made of? And so these are the questions that we're interested in, and so we want to really get a handle on what's, what these regions are like and how they go from this, from ingredients, to stars and planets. All right. So we're talking about molecules here, so we need to talk about this periodic table. But this periodic table is a little bit different from the one that you may have studied in chemistry class. Okay, For an astronomer, we've got hydrogen, of course, the most abundant element in the universe. We've also got helium. All right, And then what we have, if we're an astronomer, are metals. To an astronomer, everything else is a metal, uh, which is not good if you're a chemist to say that everything else, anyway, but this is, an, this is astronomy, you know. I do molecular astrophysics, also called astrochemistry. So of course, there's chemistry in there. Uh, so what do we have? Well, we have, of course, hydrogen and helium. And then, because we're more sophisticated, we have carbon and nitrogen and oxygen and sulfur. And, and so then what we have, you'll be surprised, that oh, we have more metals, uh, <laughs> actually. Uh, so, uh, so we have, so, so this is us, this is what we're typically dealing with. Although I guess you have to add uh, phosphorus now. There's actually some phosphorus, you know, the, the, the whole Venus thing. Again, we're looping back to it, phosphi. Uh, less studied, but these, so these are the main ones, so. All right. So interstellar molecules, what are they like? Well, I've told you about H2. This is molecular hydrogen. This is the simplest one here, okay? This is, you know, a, molecule you could get a tank of uh, on Earth here. Uh, you could fill up a, a Zeppelin with it, and, and then the Zeppelin would be a, extremely dangerous and might even explode uh, or catch fire uh, <laughs> and lead to a historical disaster. Uh, or you could also have these other molecules. So you can't buy a container of this uh, because it's too unstable on Earth. You can make it in the laboratory, and it can stick around for a very short period of time, long enough for you to do something similar to what Dr. Saylor does. Uh, you can look <laughs> at it. <laughs> you can look at the spectrum of it. Uh, and then we can take that and try to find, we get the spectrum in the laboratory, we compare it to what we get from observations, and we try to see if it's there. And this is there quite abundantly, actually. Uh, to a chemist, this is a very, very bizarre molecule. It's got one hydrogen on one end, uh, one nitrogen on the other end, and in this case, nine carbons here. So uh, this is one of the family of molecules which you find in interstellar space. So, All right, so in fact, uh, these are some of the molecules now that have been detected. Uh, this was a list compiled by my friend, uh, who's now at MIT. Uh, and so they range from very simple diatomics here to, you know, uh, these molecules here, these fullerenes. These are uh, called buckyballs. There are big collections of carbon atoms here that look like soccer balls. Uh, so you, they range in complexity, again, from the very simple, the simplest molecules up to 
shockingly complex ones. And the question is, how do you get all of these? Space is supposed to be a very harsh environment. It's supposed to be uh, a tough place, both for explorers as well as potentially molecules. And so the fact that we can get all of this, and each of them can tell us something interesting about the regions that we find them in, this is molecular astrophysics, trying to answer these questions. Now, I've been involved in the detection of a few of them. So here are some of the molecules that I've been involved in the first detection of. Uh, this one was very important. Uh, I'll talk about this one. But this one, methoxymethanol, this is starting to sound like uh, the kind of molecule you would read about in chemistry class. Uh, then there are these others. There are others that I can't actually tell you about yet for the same reasons that the Venus people can't, couldn't tell you about their discovery uh, at, before today because it's uh, embargoed. Uh, but we have some other exciting detections that are coming up in, in nature astronomy soon. But this, so this one, this, this is benzonitrile. This was the first aromatic molecule. It's got this ring structure here that was definitively identified in space. And so we are very happy. We had this paper in Science about it. Uh, and then there was even a nice article in Scientific American about it. So that was very nice. And then the rest of the internet got a hold of it. So you know, we had Gizmodo, and uh, we had Newsweek. And the thing that they liked was that it smelled like almonds. And so you know, now people may say that space smells like almonds. Uh, so, uh, so there's another fact for you. All right. So how are they observed? Well, we look at the electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, for molecules, we're typically looking at the longer wavelengths here. So we're looking at the microwave and the radio wavelength, as opposed to the uh, optical astronomers who are looking at more of the visible light. Uh, so we're looking at longer wavelengths. And we're looking at these clouds, uh, either the photons that they emit, the light that they emit directly, or if there's a star in the background, we see how the light from the star gets absorbed. So for that, we use big radio telescopes uh, like that, uh, or even telescopes on planes. Uh, this is an infrared observatory called SOFIA. Uh, so actually, uh, we're, I'm part of a big project called the Gotham Project, where we're hunting for aromatic molecules in a particular region called TMC1. So getting involved in this, this is one possibility there. Dust, I mentioned dust. If you wondered what it looks like, it looks something like this. Uh, very irregular, composed of carbon, etc. And so what I'm interested in is the interaction between these molecules in the gas and the dust, and something called cosmic rays. So I'm interested in tracing this history here, from diffuse clouds to stars and planets, ultimately. I want to know everything that's going into making a solar system, so we can predict what the stars and planets are going to be like. So again, in here, you have these dust grains, and that's very important. And bathing all of this are cosmic rays, interstellar radiation from a variety of sources, supernovae, black holes at the center of the galaxy, uh, that's uh, is hitting all of these things and causing lots of interesting reactions that are bad if you're an astronaut and interesting if you're uh, an interstellar dust grain. So. Right. So because we can't go out and scoop up a bit of molecular cloud, what do we do? Well, we can observe it, but if we want to really understand what's going on, uh, we, can't, we have to do something else. We have to use computer simulations. That's the only way we can sort of reassemble a coherent picture of what these nebulae were like. Uh, and so that's what, that's what I do. Uh, and so the models that I use, you can get pictures like this. So this is. Uh, imagine a dust grain, an interstellar dust grain. It's got ice around it, and this is a cutaway view. And then you get this thing here. So what's that? Well, that's, imagine a cosmic ray, a particle of interstellar radiation hitting the ice, breaking things apart. In your cell, this is very bad. In an interstellar dust grain ice mantle, this is OK. Uh, so here's what the track looks like. It looks a little bit like that. Some people say it looks like an ant colony. Uh, but this is what gets formed uh, in your bodies if you were near, let's say, a, a source of ionizing radiation. So again, not great for organisms, but very interesting in interstellar space. If 
you're interested in this, uh, there are other possibilities other than becoming an astronomer uh, you could go into. One of them is you could go into medical physics. Medical physics is a very interesting field. Uh, hospitals need physicists to uh, do things involving uh, radioisotopes, and so this is a fairly high-paying career, and, and the sorts of work that I do on, in terms of space radiation is related to that, so that's a possibility there. So we write these codes. Uh, I've developed some new ways of thinking about how to include this radiation into uh, the kinds of models that we use for either, let's say, the atmosphere of Venus or an interstellar region. Uh, and here's one example, again, not involving phosphorus. This involves sulfur. Uh, so this is one question that I was able to try to answer with uh, the programs that I, I developed. Uh, as we go along here in the evolution of interstellar environments, sulfur starts to disappear. So when we are in these diffuse clouds here, uh, there's about as much sulfur as we would expect. But as we go along, it disappears by a factor of a thousand. And so what's going on? Well, uh, we were able to think about, well, what's happening in the solar system? You know, sulfur is going into this yellowish form called S8. It's elemental sulfur. It's what you would find around, for instance, Mount Etna. So, or on Io, one of the Galilean moons. So using the simulations uh, that I've developed, uh, we can take a look and say, for instance, uh, what happens when you think about uh, various possibilities. You can rule out, uh, for instance, that uh, some molecules may be the reservoirs of the missing sulfur. Uh, that's what we did in this paper. And we showed that, in fact, uh, it's likely in this elemental form that you could find if you went to near a volcano. So these are the same kinds of models that were used when thinking about the Venusian atmosphere, comparing the observations with the, uh, with the simulations and in this case saying that, okay, there's way more phosphine here than we should be making uh, in their simulation. So what's going on? Um, so that's what we do here. Yes. So just to conclude, there are lots of cool molecules in space. And doing computational work is uh, essential for understanding these. Uh, so I develop ways of making them better. And uh, so you can use them to solve interstellar mysteries again. So I think it's pretty cool. You can figure out what's going into making stars and planets. So yeah, so thank you very much. Any quick questions for Dr. Tinglebecker? What's the importance of finding the aromatic molecules in space? Like what does that do for us? Yes. Uh, the importance is that uh, we think that these kinds of molecules contain up to uh, some large fraction of the carbon in the universe, 5 to 20 percent of the carbon in the universe. And so we, we know that they're out there, but we have never been able to identify specific individual ones before. Uh, we've only seen the big sort of smudged fingerprints, effectively, of these molecules. Uh, this is the first time we were able to get a clear fingerprint of a specific aromatic molecule. Uh, and so this was uh, why it was such an interesting finding. It's like if the criminal left fingerprints everywhere, but then they smudged them so that you couldn't really see who it was. Now, it's, we, we knew there were criminals in space. We knew there were aromatic molecules in space, but we just couldn't identify specifically which ones are there uh, until that.